right, you guys. Good morning. We're going to get started because we have three great talks today. Uh, two fellows and one of our neurosurgery residents. So first off, Chris Kamansky, our, one of our first year retina fellows, is going to start us off uh, talking about a, a classic case of sympathy. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to present an interesting case that I shared with Dr. Vitaly and Dr. Shakur. So the patient's chief complaint is he came in complaining of macropsia in the right eye. His history of present illness is that he's a 35-year-old man with a past ocular history of ruptured globe in the left eye 27 days ago. He woke up in the morning and noticed his eye, his vision was a little blurred in his good eye and that images were distorted in a way as if he was looking through a magnifying glass. He denies pain in both eyes and reports no change in vision in the left eye. His past ocular history, as we just discussed, was a ruptured globe repaired by one of our other presenters today, excellently, um, with uveal prolapse. It was a nail gun injury while at work. His past medical history was non-contributory, family history was non-contributory. Social history as he works in construction, it's uninsured. Um, his current health care is being covered by workers' compensation. He lives at home with a wife and four children. He admits they had a tattoo three years ago, but it's not raised or erythematous. He traveled outside the US numerous times to Mexico, most recently six years ago. He was born in Mexico, moved to the US at the age of six. He spent one week incarcerated in a jail in Las Vegas. He has three cats, occasional alcohol use, and denies high-risk sexual behavior or intravenous drug use. His medications are pernicillin and acetate four times a day in the left eye, no known allergies. So on exam, his visual acuity is 2060. This was down from two weeks previously when it was 2015. And then in his left eye, he was bare LP. His pupils were Round and reactive to light in the right eye, 5 to 3, is unable to be obtained in the left eye due to a 75% high FEMA, but there was a relative after pupillary defect by reverse. His real visual fields were full in the right eye, unable to be obtained in the left eye, and a pressure of 11 in the right and soft in the left. This is a, his anterior segment exam. It was unremarkable in the right eye except for trace haze in the anterior vitreous. In his left eye, we see a photo from a later visit, but it shows that he has resuming a resu resolving edema of the eyelids, two plus injection of the conjunctiva. He has nylon sutures inferiorly. And um, at the time I saw him, he had about a 75% high femus. And, um, the posterior structures were unable to be visualized in this eye. This is a color from this montage of the right eye. And what we can see here is that the, there's some trace vitreous haze. Uh, the optic nerve is normal. There's a normal course and caliber to the vessels. However, attention is drawn to the macula where there's these creamy subretinal infiltrates and then maybe more punctate lesions in the temporal macula. There's also, if you could, there's a stereoscopic view, you can see this pigmented demarcation line, and these actually are areas of retinal elevation and around the optic nerve as well. This is an OCT macula of the right eye, and um, this is an enhanced depth image as well. And the media is again clear, just disruption of the normal foveal contour with this large cystic space within the retina. There's areas of hyperreflectivity of the outer retina as well as subretinal fluid throughout. And uh, important to note is normally we can see um, the scleral um, hyperreflective band around here, but the choroid is so thickened that you cannot appreciate the sclera on this enhanced depth image. These are other representative scans through the macula. Through the superior macula, you see a large collection of subretinal fluid and a, a, a nodule on the RPE. And now we get a better appreciation that there's these mat septated macrocysts within the retina and that are in the different layers. 
and then inferiorly we see another large collection of subretinal fluid. We performed angiography, and in the ICG angiography, the early image is grossly normal, maybe some shadowing in the areas of subretinal fluid collection. However, in the later images, around 10 minutes, we see these areas, punctate areas of hyperfluorescence throughout the posterior pole and around the optic nerve. Now, in the fluorescein angiogram, there's a normal arm to retina time. However, at 41 seconds, we can see the emergence of these punctate areas of hyperfluorescence throughout the posterior pole. We didn't have, uh, we lost him for a few minutes because he became nauseated and was vomiting in the bathroom, but then came back and we got a later image. And what we can see is there is some leakage from those punctate areas of hyperfluorescence, but most notably there's pooling in these subretinal fluid collections. And then even pulling within these septated macrocysts, and you can see the hypofluorescent areas, this line where the septa are between these intraretinal cystic spaces. So at this point, I'll open up to the uh, residents for a differential on this patient. Brad, what do you think? Um, given this history, I think. Uh Perfect. Anything that you would want to rule out to make sure that's not just a confounding uh, thing that might be a little dangerous to treat uh, with steroids. Yeah, so it's infectious etiologies you definitely want to rule out. Absolutely. So good job. And then there's just a more complete differential for exudative retinal detachments vaguely. This is much more likely to be sympathetic ophthalmia. So the assessment and plan is this patient has sympathetic ophthalmia of the right eye. We did the following lab workup. So CBC, CMP, RPR, FT, ABS, Clonk Gold, ACE, Lysozyme, HIV, and we want to get a chest x-ray. Um, pending the negative RPR and FT, ABS, we were going to start oral steroids and then have them come back in two weeks to initiate immunomodulatory therapy. So at this point, I would like this to talk about sympathetic ophthalmia. Uh, because it's a pretty interesting um, disease. So it's incredibly rare. Ranges in, from 0.1 to 3% of ocular trauma. And about 70% of these cases are accidental trauma. And about 30% of these cases historically are uh, induced by surgery. And um, with vitreoretinal surgery being the most common and the most up-to-date um, incidence would be about 0.01%. What's interesting is that that breakdown changes based on setting and time. While historically it was more in the 30% induced by surgery, it's climbed to more in the 40% range um, at this point. Versus um, if we look at more international data, which probably has more to do with less of them, like surgery being performed there and maybe a higher incidence of trauma that those are more of the classic numbers of 70 and 30 percent. So I really went down the rabbit hole with learning about sympathetic ophthalmia because a lot of the literature is very old with sympathetic ophthalmia. And you can really see some uh, interesting observations about how much uh, caring for the eye has changed over the last 100, 150 years. And the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia due to accidental trauma when there was very little care really that could be offered to these patients was quite high, as high as 2% in most of the literature prior to 1900. In the early 1900s, about half percent. And then up until about 1965, then we really saw their decreasing incidence after ocular trauma as surgical and medical intervention for trauma improved. And then the most recent data around that 0.1% of eyes. Similarly, um, there's been a big change in the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia after intraocular surgery. These are some older numbers, um, but they're some of the actual studies that looked at this prospectively. And cataracts in 1969 are very different than they are now, but even back then it was an incredibly low rate and probably just lower today. And vitrectomy has stayed about the same in the 0.02% range. So about 1 in 10,000 cases. 
The mechanism by which sympathetic ophthalmia occurs is a T cell mediated autoimmune response. And there are certain HLA <coughs> associations. The most notable in our population is HLA DR4. It's really a complex disease with stages of an active inflammation and quiescence, and recurrences can be months to years to many, many years later. So the key questions I had when learning about this case and taking care of this patient were, were what is the appropriate immunomodulatory therapy? What are the indications for a nucleation of the inciting eye? And then what are the indications for surgery or surgical repair of the inciting eye? And again, I, I went down the rabbit hole and I, I learned a lot about history. And I found I wanted to share some of the things that I learned about. So while sympathetic ophthalmia is kind of a, sounds like a fairy tale disease that you would tell to scare your children from getting injuries to their eye because you could have an injury to one eye and then months, maybe even years later, you could lose the vision in your other eye. So this was written about as far back as Hippocrates. But um, in Western literature, the first mention of it was by George Bartish in the German literature in 1583. And I, I included it because it was the first mentioned in Western literature, but also because he, he was a barber surgeon. So he had no formal education, and at the age of 13, he became an apprentice in a barber shop. And that's how um, many surgeons came into the career. And this is a picture of him um, couching an eye in the 1500s. Uh, so things have changed a lot. Now, the first detailed write-up of the presentation, the thoughts of the etiology, the prognosis of these patients came in this pretty thorough write-up by William McKenzie in 1840. And this is considered the time when there was a renaissance in ophthalmic knowledge. Um, and I w had a quote from this, and it really reminded me that we, uh, people used to write differently in the medical language than they do now, and I just wanted to share it. So, whenever I see sympathetic ophthalmia, even in its most first stage, I know I now contend with an affection which, however slight in its present symptoms may be, is one of the most dangerous inflammations to which the organ of vision is exposed. I wish I could write like that. <laughs> so just a few years later, um, part of this renaissance were, uh, were kind of a newfound goal of treating eye disease. And um, Dr. Pritchard published in 1851 the first advocation for enucleation as treatment for sympathetic ophthalmia. And so the idea would be if you observe the symptoms of sympathetic ophthalmia, you would enucleate the inciting eye. Um, and this is important because for the next hundred years, this was the only real treatment for sympathetic ophthalmia. Um, in 1911, Dr. Elschnig, who um, is huge player in ophthalmology, um, hypothesized that sympathetic ophthalmia was an immunologic disorder. This is a really important distinction because up until this point, it was believed that something happened within the inciting eye, and maybe it was uh, some type of infectious process. It would travel down the optic nerve through the chiasm, back down the contralateral optic nerve, and then infect the sympathizing eye. And so Dr. Elschnig's belief that maybe there's an immunologic mechanism by which this has happened was a really paradigm shift, and this would then guide us for the next um, 100 years of how we've thought about it. Uh, this leads us to when the treatment migrated away from a nucleation and surgery as the only way to treat sympathetic ophthalmia. And well, this isn't from the ophthalmology literature. It was a, a huge discovery in medicine, and that's in 1948, doctors Kendall, Hench, and Rickstein had found a way to synthesize and then came up with the idea to administer corticosteroids to a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And amazingly, just two years after the initial publication, they received the Nobel Prize. So it was a landmark study and just two years later is when the first use of steroids were used in the eye. And as we'll see, that had pretty major effects on how sympathetic ophthalmia um, was treated. 
So this is an, another quote, and I think it was interesting. Some of it isn't as um, a, um, a, applicable to today. But however, the reasons for doing local, so they came up with a topical subconjunctival injection of cortisone as well as a topical um, calcium or, or drop. And they, they identified that there was going to be less danger of a systemic reaction. They, they thought the cost is possibly less, but they didn't know we were going to have alluvium and Ozerdex, so maybe systemic steroids are a little cheaper. And they used to have to hospitalize these patients who were getting systemic steroids. Um, and then probably not true, but interesting that their goal that local treatment could be continued almost indefinitely. And certainly a higher concentration was possible. So this was the original publication of steroids being used in the eye. And we're not going to go through all the details, but they used everything from iridocyclitis to sclerokeratitis. Um, and then now at the bottom, you see the first three cases treated uh, with sympathetic ophthalmia. And this is what the point I wanted to get to with this article published by, from Mass Eye is that when you look at the number of cases of sympathetic ophthalmia, and then you look at when steroids were introduced to control inflammation, either after surgery or after trauma, not only is this a treatment for it, you, this was pretty convincing that this may actually decrease the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia. Um, and then looking at the outcomes for these patients before steroids were available, only about 60% would maintain 2100 or better vision versus 90% after they started using steroids. So dramatic improvement in care. And now I'll just fast forward um, to an article published in 2018 of 130 <coughs> cases at a multi-center uh, case series. And just talk about where we are now. Because after steroids, <coughs> we eventually developed immunosuppression as a way to control this disease long term. And looking at the patients, that steroids are used in almost every patient, so 98%, and then immunosuppressants in 70% of these patients. And this, the centers are in the UK, India, and Singapore. In terms of what type of immunosuppressants, it really is most, um, mostly dominated by the use of anti-metabolites. And in this series, it was azathioprine, but in the US, it would be methotrexate or mycophenolate. With most of these patients being controlled on zero or one long-term immunomodulatory therapy. I was interested in that the nucleation of the blind eye in the series, the modern series, was still pretty high. Um, and especially when you look at in the UK, with 50% of the inciting eyes being enucleated. In terms of just looking up in the book, these are the mainstay of first line treatments, so the antimetabolites and then cyclosporin, uh, second line being anti TNF uh, biologics. So that talks about how we can manage this from a immunomodulatory therapy standpoint. And then I, I got really interested in understanding the reason why a nucleation can be treated. So this is the data from the 1980 publication for Mass Eye, which looked at and argued for the possible nucleation of the inciting eye if there's no visual potential in it. And what we see is that the time to nucleation in final visual acuity better than 2070. And what they found is if patients were nucleated in their inciting eye within two weeks of the onset of symptoms of sympathetic ophthalmia, so this is not from their trauma, but from the onset of sympathetic ophthalmia, that 74% of patients maintain better than 2070 vision versus if it was more than six months, it was down at 50%. But it was more, I think, uh, enlightening to look at when you compared the untreated cases versus their steroid cases, because in this series they included patients from way back in 1913 who were treated with steroids. And when you look at the untreated patients, if it was less than two weeks to nucleation, 81% maintain good vision versus if it was more than six months, it was down at 17%. So a pretty dismal outcome if you didn't get a nucleation early and you didn't have steroids. But once there was access to steroids, that those numbers came a lot closer together. And now with modern immunomodulatory therapy, it's felt that there's not a difference. And then this is the article that was arguing for that. And that 
they found that in 2000, enucleation of the exciting eye was not related to any visual outcomes, and it didn't attribute um, any resolution of disease, um, and there's no significant difference in the maintenance corticosteroid dose for these patients. And now the last question I had is, are there additional risks for trying to repair an inciting eye? And this is another 2018 article that was published. And they reviewed the literature. And what's really interesting in the sympathetic ophthalmia literature is it's not uncommon for the inciting eye to actually be the better seeing eye long term. And so that really caring for the inciting eye as much as the exciting eye is, is very important. Um, these are the four cases that they had. In three of the four cases, two of the four cases for trauma, two of the four from vitrectomy. Um, they had surgical interventions afterwards. There's one PK, one clock coma drainage device, one oil removal, and one vitrectomy and so silicon oil tamponade. And what was found is the patient who got the PK, their vision improved dramatically. And the patient who got the glaucoma drainage device, their vision was 2040 and it stayed about 2040. And the patient who got the oil removed, their vision stayed about the same, around 2200. And then in the last patient, their vision went from hand motion to um, NLP. So one patient did not do well. But this argues that it's very important to care for the uh, inciting eye, um, as oftentimes good vision can be maintained. So when we look at our patient, his inciting eye status is he was light perception without projection. He had a RAPD and his eye was soft. His B, can, B scan shows a closed funnel RD emanating to the wound um, in a thickened choroid. And so it was felt that this eye had very little um, visual potential. And so at this point, he's just being observed in his left eye. In terms of this clinical course, we can see his presentation, and then just after three weeks of steroids, how dramatically he's improving. And his vision went from 2060 to 2040. And then now, four months later, his vision's 2015 minus two. And he has a pretty normal looking retina. There's a little bit of ellipsoid zone change in the outer retina, but he's doing great. He's on 25 milligrams of subcutaneous methotrexate each week. He's off steroids and the plans for two years of immunomodulatory therapy um, after the cessation of steroid, at which point he'll be discontinued and then observed closely. So I'd like to thank you for having me today. These are my references, and uh, this is my son. Any uh, numbers on uh, time of incidence of sympathetic after initial trauma can it occur years later? Absolutely. There's a case of it occurring 43 years after presentation. However, about 80% of cases happen between two to three weeks and three months. And then about 90% of cases are within a year. So most of them happen. There are outliers, though, of them happening many years later. So Chris, should we be dilating open globes like in follow-up of their other eye? Or yeah. Should we be looking for this, or is it something that they typically just present symptomatically? And I think that's the answer, is it, that they, they have symptoms. And, um, and if they have symptoms in their other eye, absolutely, we need to look at it very closely. Uh, which was really interesting in this case, is that oftentimes they don't present or aren't able to get to um, uh, a specialist all that quickly. And so this patient had had an excellent globe repair at the Moran and then just three weeks later presented the same morning, was able to be seen in a uveitis clinic and um, get a full workup. So the imaging was really interesting here and the treatment started very quickly and having an outcome of 2015 vision is we're really, really happy with. Um, so I think getting therapy to start early is important and so counseling patients if they ever develop symptoms in the other eye after they've had trauma is, I think, really a key aspect to it. But yeah, I don't think dilating every month for months would um, be likely to change how we uh, find the treatment.